Good to see everyone this morning. Did everyone get a study sheet this morning? If you didn't, just raise your hand. And I got a couple of boys. We'll get one right to you. Just raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Here's some here. We got plenty. I'm glad that Shaylee's able to be with us today with our new baby. Glad to have glad to have them with us today. Anybody else need one? We got plenty. Here's one right here. Right behind Kevin. I think that's his name. Isn't that your name, boy? Yeah. Right behind Kevin. Anybody else? It's my privilege to present to you today the inspired Word of God. And what we need to remember about the Bible is that it truly is from God. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul said to Timothy, From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee as unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished to every good work. 1 Peter 4 verse 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. But as this word is spoken... We must understand there is power in God's Word. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is God's power to save people. Now as we look at the Word of God, we must also understand Hebrews 4 verse 12 where the Hebrew writer talked about God's Word and said the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder even to the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What does that mean? That means the Word of God can go right down to the innermost part of our souls if we allow it to do so. If we allow it to do its work in us, it will go right down into the innermost parts of our hearts and prick our hearts and cause us to repent so we can be closer to God. ready for heaven. This is not some kind of American business here. We're getting each other ready for eternal life. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In John 6, 68, when the disciples, Jesus said, You're going to leave me? Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John 6, 68. Now we're studying on Wednesday night the book of Exodus. And I wanted to give you this study sheet so you can have it. Bring it back tonight. I want to prepare you for that study. I remember as a young Christian when I would open the Bible and start to read it, and I wanted to learn it so badly, but I was not able to do so. It was very difficult for me. If someone had introduced these books to me and explained the contents, the background, maybe I would have understood a little better, but nobody did that back then, but we're going to do that today. We're going to look, turn in your Bible, to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. Now notice the first 
three word, the first few words of the book. Now. That's the first word. That connects us with the last verse of Genesis 50. You remember what happened in Genesis 50, the last verse? We're looking at a coffin. We're looking at a casket. And the great Bible character Joseph is in that casket. Exodus is going to continue that story and it's going to show us how that casket is one day going to be returned to Palestine. So now connects with what's been already told in Genesis. Now these are the names. That's the title of the book in the Hebrew writer. Most of you are probably aware of the fact that the titles of the books of the Bible are not inspired. Neither are the chapter and verses. These things were added later. The titles are not inspired. In fact, different versions of the Bible have different titles. The Hebrew title is, These Are the Names. And sometimes they would shorten it and just call it Names. In the English Bible, the word for the title is Exodus. That is a transliteration from the Greek translation of the Old Testament the Septuagint that Jesus and the apostles often quoted from. The Latin Vulgate follows the same example as the English version and calls it Exodus. Exodus means departure, to go out. In chapter 19 and verse number 1, we find the word. And it talks about how the children of Israel would go out from the land of Egypt. So the Exodus, the main part of the book, is showing us how God's people are going to be redeemed from the slavery of the Egyptians and how they are going to go out of Egypt. But that's not all the book's about. In fact, the Exodus is only found in chapter 12 through 14. We have events that are covered before the Exodus. We have events covered during the Exodus. And when the children of Israel get to Mount Sinai and receive God's law, we have some events that are recorded while they are still in the region of Mount Sinai. So it only doesn't cover the Exodus, but that is the primary theme of the book. And that's one of the greatest events of all the Old Testament is when God's people departed slavery under the leadership of a man that God had prepared by the name of Moses. Who, by the way, was 80 years old. Most of us might think, what can anybody do at 80? Well, in our generation, people, anybody that's over 50, they think you're senile. So boy, if you make it to 80, you're really out of it in this culture. But other cultures were wiser than this one. And they realized the wisdom that was contained in this beautiful leader of God's people. His name was Moses. 
Moses is the author of this book, and he is the principal character. At this time, I'm not going to present the arguments to show you why I believe Moses is the author of this book. We'll do that at a later time because I think it's important that you know that. And that's covered on the back side of this handout. Now, what do we learn about Exodus? What are the central events that are covered in this book? The deliverance of Israel from Egypt. They had been in slavery for many long years and have cried out to God. Their slavery has tended to become very, very severe over the years. And they have cried out to God. So the central events in Exodus is the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. God calls it redemption. Redemption is a word that means to buy back. He bought them back from slavery. So they are redeemed, delivered from Egyptian slavery. And as God does that wonderful work, now He is going to create a theocratic nation. A theocratic nation means God is the one in charge. That's what a theocracy means. The constitution of this theocracy is going to be the law of Moses that's given to us in this beautiful book of Exodus. That's going to be their constitution. They're going to form a nation of people. You remember that God told Abraham one day this would happen? Nations will arise from you. Your descendants will be more than the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. Now these people have become God's special nation in the book of Exodus. In chapter 19, verse 3 through 19, there is explained to us clearly that God takes this family of Israelites, unites them together, and makes them a theocratic nation under His leadership with Moses' law as their constitution. This is made clear in chapter 19, 3 through 19. God brings Himself to the Israelites nationally through redemption, buying them back from slavery. As the chosen people who, through whom Moses would come, or through whom the Messiah would come, God chose these people. The whole reason for choosing them is that one day the wonderful Messiah is going to come through these people. In Genesis 12, verse 3, that's what God meant when He said to Abraham, Through your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. In the New Testament in Galatians 3 verse 16, Paul says by inspiration that this was talking about Jesus Christ. So through this nation, God is going to bring this wondrous Savior into the world to save us from our sins. Matthew 1 21, He shall save His people from their sins. That's all going to come from this beautiful nation that God has created. Now what's going to happen? Under this Mosaic Constitution, under this Mosaic government, God is going to come and dwell with His people. When a dignitary comes to dwell with ordinary people, 
a lot of preparations have to be made. If one of the former presidents of the United States decided that he wanted to make his home in Portland, a lot of changes would have to come about because we are dwelling with a dignitary. Well, these people are dwelling with the greatest dignitary of all time, the Creator of the universe. So as He dwells within His people, many changes had to be made for God to stay among them. The beautiful part about this is look in Ephesians 2 in the New Testament and verse 22 when it talks about the beauty of Christ's church and explains to us that in the church there is the habitation of God. You know what that word habitation means? Dwelling place. There is the dwelling place of God through the Spirit. Ephesians 2, verse number 22. The Bible tells the church that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. God now dwells not within the children of Israel. He now dwells within His church not within a certain nationality, but but within His church where it is found all over the world. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20, Paul explained, You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirits, which are God's. We are bought with a price. 1 Peter 1, 21. 1 Peter 1, 18 says we have been redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and without blemish. So we have been purchased by God with His own blood. We belong to Him. He dwells among us in His church. So the nation of Israel was pointing forward to the time when Jesus would come to earth and say in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. So all of these things are being foreshadowed. Let us look at the contents of the book. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, you have this beautiful promise to Abraham. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. Whoever blesses you, I'll bless. Whoever curses you, I'll curse. And through your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And then in Genesis 12, verse 7, he says, I'm going to give you a land. Okay, if you take Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Now, in Exodus, this connects these people with the theocratic nation of God that's going to one day have its own land in Palestine. They are delivered and placed under the Mosaic Covenant so they can be a holy nation. Look at Exodus 19, verse 5 and verse 6. God says to Moses, I want you to tell my people this. I have chosen you from the peoples of the earth, for the earth is mine. And then in verse 6, Exodus 19, 6, He says, You are a kingdom of priests. You are a holy nation. These people were to be separate from the rest of the ungodly world that surrounded them. They were to have a priesthood to take care of their sins. 
we find the same exact language in the New Testament concerning the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy people. Talking to the church, that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light which in times past were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You see, now the church, that word peculiar just means you belong to God. The church now is that nation, 1 Peter 2, 9, that holy nation, that chosen elect generation, that royal priesthood, we now are responsible to Almighty God to show forth the praise of God who's called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. At one time we weren't His people, but now we are the people of God. And He said, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims that you abstain from fleshly lust which war against your soul. We're still at war like the children of Israel. We are still God's nation. We are God's people. Chapter 1 through 4. Chapter 1 through 4. Is actually an introduction to all of the book. And it gives you the background for the whole book. In verse 1, in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, Exodus 1, 6 and 7, Joseph and that generation have died off, but the children of Israel have multiplied in a wonderful way. And so the king is concerned because there's so many of them that if their enemies come, they'll unite with their enemies. So he's very concerned about the populous Israelite people. So in chapter 1, verse number 8, the Bible says, There arose a king, a new king, who knew not Joseph. Now think about that. There wouldn't be an Egypt if it wasn't for Joseph. There wouldn't be a France if it wasn't for the U.S. of A. You think they appreciate it? I don't don't know. There would not even be an Egypt left if it were not for Joseph. But look how quickly people forget. Look how we forget. This man saved his whole nation. People tend to be so ungrateful. And they don't remember. Here comes a Pharaoh that doesn't know. He doesn't respect what Joseph has done for Egypt. And so he became he becomes so worried in chapter 1, 10 through 19 that he makes the Israelites slaves with bitter bondage. Notice verse 14. Chapter 1, verse 14. He made their lives bitter. Have you ever made anyone's life bitter I have I hope God will forgive me I've made people's life bitter if you have made people's life bitter I hope God will give you time to repent and I hope your heart will be 
soft enough to repent. We cannot do this to people and go to heaven. We cannot do this to individuals and be right with God. This man is fighting against the people of God and making their life miserable. God won't forget it. God doesn't forget. He makes their lives bitter. Verse 22 says, Cast their male children into the Nile River. In chapter 2, 1 through 6, Moses is born. His mama hides him for three months. But you know how these kids are, man. <laughs> they something else. They get a little older than that. They get loud. You can put your hand over their mouth. You can do about anything. They, they make a lot of noise. So he gets to the point she can't hide him. Makes a little boat and puts him in the reeds by the Nile River. Has his sister follow along. Pharaoh's daughter comes out to bathe her sister. Now Pharaoh's the one that said throw him in the river, remember? So if you were going to have somebody find this baby, it wouldn't be Pharaoh's daughter, would it? Do you see how we think? And the difference in the way God thinks? At just the right time, she sees that little boat and she tells her servants, go get that for him. And she opens it up and there's a baby and he cries. And the Bible says she had compassion. I wouldn't have expected that. Pharaoh said all these kids are to be killed. I wouldn't expect Pharaoh's daughter to have compassion, but God knew her heart. And that little boat came just at the right time because God knew the heart of the heathen woman and she saved this child and his own mother nurses him. That's providence. That's God taking care of His people. Moses becomes Pharaoh's daughter and he sees one of his brethren being wronged and he kills the Egyptian and hides him in the sand. And the next day, one of his brethren is taking advantage of another brother, if you can imagine that happening among brethren. And he says, why, why, do, you, why do you do this? You know what he said. Well, who made you the judge? Who made you the judge and ruler over us? You going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? And so Moses realized this thing had been known. Pharaoh finds out about it and Moses has to flee to the wilderness. He flees to the wilderness in chapter 2, verse 15. Chapter 3, God calls Moses from that burning bush. And Moses and Aaron are to speak for God's people. And in chapter 5, they appear before Pharaoh himself. Do you see how God takes care of His own people? Do you see how much God loves us? Are you one of His special people? If you've never obeyed the Gospel, you're a lost. If you've never turned from your sins and been immersed, you are in your sins and lost. To become one of God's people, you must obey this Gospel can do that right now while we stand and while we sing.